The Fallout TV show has been a massive success story for both Bethesda and Amazon. It is up there as one of the best video game adaptations to date, and in recent memory we've had some pretty good ones. From Arcane to Cyberpunk Edge Runners to The Last of Us TV show, Sonic and Mario both have had some great results at the box office. But yeah, it really does seem like the video game industry is turning around the curse that has really plagued this industry for the longest time in this medium, although the Hollywood medium. Because if you don't know, there was a long graveyard in years before the last couple of decades of just really bad adaptations that were massive failures. From Doom the movie, Assassin's Creed the movie, Resident Evil, Tomb Raider kind of had a little bit of success, but the quality was hit or miss. And even in recent memory, we've had some kind of really bad shows from Resident Evil as well and also the halo tv show which just doesn't at all feel like halo and master chief feels like commander shepherd and i really could go off about the halo show because of how laughable it is but i will just say that the fallout tv show has been amazing it's surprising because beforehand some of the remarks coming from the cast and crew made me a little concerned and also amazon dumping all the episodes at once i just was not sure what to expect from the show but it ended up being extremely faithful to the lore tons of easter eggs tons of connections to the games you could tell that the showrunners the writers are actual fans of the games i think it was said in one of the interviews that one of the main writers behind the show has been a fan of the franchise since fallout one so you can see that dna the vibe of fallout the atmosphere it's all over the show and i really really appreciate that and it also it helps that the characters are extremely interesting well written the storylines got me intrigued so i'm looking forward to the future of the fallout tv show now the reception to this tv show has been extremely positive so much so that we have seen an influx of players into games like fallout new vegas fallout 3 fallout 4 76 and even the earlier fallout games and uh, we saw this previously happen with other pieces of entertainment such as arcane cyberpunk edge runners and the last of us tv show because those are good adaptations people are interested in the respective franchises and yes this is another opportunity to take a dig at the Halo show because there was no influx because that show stinks and it didn't draw interest from really anybody. Now it is worth mentioning that Rotten Tomatoes, it just this is something that you don't really see with the big named IP nowadays, but we have universal consensus that yeah, the Fallout TV show season one was great. You have users and critics all coming together to rave about it. Now, unfortunately though, this show is not without its controversy. We explored some of this in my last video, but it seems to be that a lot of New Vegas fans, specifically the the Fallout community is fractured on this show. And I think it's really just the fact that Bethesda is finally going west coast. They're exploring territory that was previously explored by Obsidian Entertainment, Black Isle Studios, and Interplay. And now Bethesda is making some decisions about the west coast and making certain things canon. And specifically, there was controversy with Shady Sands with how it was nuked. The timeline has been there's been confusion surrounding it but fortunately today we did get some clarification coming from bethesda's todd howard and amazon they also discussed some of the plans that they have and also teased a little bit about the timeline of fallout the tv show and it just is worth mentioning that the only retcon specifically that I have seen that doesn't make any sense is really the geographical issues with the TV show, because Shady Sands is not set in LA. The Boneyard is supposed to be there, and it is not. Maybe that is something that they fix in future seasons, but that is really the only thing that specifically does not have an answer to it. And I know that there was actually some controversy with this originally, the airship, because there was a second airship being introduced to the franchise. I think there was an interview from Bethesda or Amazon which named this something different than the Pritowin, but players, fans of the franchise had already theorized that this was some misdirection because based on history, Caswinon was actually an alternate name for King Arthur's ship, the Pritowin. And eagle-eyed people who watched uh, the first episode noticed that the ship actually says Pritowin. So pretty much the Brotherhood of Steel that was located on the East Coast, the Commonwealth, within nine years, 2287 to 2296, have gone to the West Coast. And I think this is Bethesda laying their groundwork down for Fallout 5. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that groundwork being laid out with the uh, TV show in future seasons. But it is worth mentioning another big retcon and something that may be addressed in future seasons is who started the Great War. Because the Fallout co-creator, I think it is Tim Kaine, 
previously in the past had said that it was actually China, but the TV show makes clear that it may have actually been vault Tech. although if you watch that scene, it's not clear that it was vault Tech. it could be the actual Enclave, which I assume that's what they're setting up for future seasons, the big Enclave threat. Now, there has been a lot going on with the Fallout TV show and just Fallout in general. We had Emil Pagliarello, he's one of the lead uh, writers on the Fallout franchise, Bethesda. He um, made a decision, this is just, I, I don't even know how to... He said this, given the great vibes recently and the millions of amazing Fallout fans, I feel like the time is right to finally share an unknown link between Fallout 1 and Fallout 4. Remember the Fallout 1 opening movie annexation of Canada, the, right next to the soldier that kills just an unarmed man? Um, yeah, he says this is Nate, so it makes Nate a war criminal. And quickly, Emil just got a lot of people going at him for this. Emil is one of those individuals of the Fallout franchise that is always getting attacked because of the quality of the writing, especially with recent uh, Bethesda games, but he did not help himself with this one, and he did go into full on damage control trying to explain it and saying he was just trying to do something that was cool, but um, yeah. There's also a massive update for Fallout 4 coming in just a couple of weeks. This is the next-gen update. It features a ton of new improvements and upgrades for the game. There's also some new skins and stuff but there's also apparently it looks like a new quest line featuring the enclave and i really do think bethesda is starting to build up that threat that i personally do believe will be featured in fallout 5. now it is worth mentioning that even this comes with its own drawbacks this new content because updating an eight to nine year old game and when it has such a strong modding community well that just well, all of the mods are pretty much going to be broken for a period of time. Specifically, we have Fallout London. This is one of the big mods that the Fallout 4 community is getting excited for. It was supposed to release just within days of the Fallout 4 next-gen update, and they've had to delay as they just know it's going to be broken. They don't want all of their work to, well, have to be pretty much just sitting in a state that's not even playable. So this is something that the modding community is going to have to deal with, which uh, there's pros and cons pretty much with all this stuff. But specifically, we did see Obsidian Entertainment, the original Fallout lead, Tim Kane, voicing his, you know, love for the TV show. But he also just spoke on the relationship, the community with Bethesda. This is the headline coming from PC Gamer. Original Fallout lead, Tim Kane, loves the new show, but remains baffled by how destructive fans can act towards people who are trying to create things. And uh, Kane was invited by Bethesda's Todd Howard to the premiere event of the Chinese Theater in LA and seemed to enjoy the big budget celebration of the Fallout series. As for the show itself, Kane had nothing but praise for the premiere, which consisted of the season's first two episodes. I was literally at the edge of my seat. Kane appreciated the performances and storytelling, but singled out how the show nailed the Fallout vibe as its biggest achievement. I was just looking at all the props he said of the one scene. I realized after a few minutes went by that I had not followed the dialogue at all because I was so engrossed by it visually. On a more sour note, Kane took time to address the way fans of the series can behave poorly online, particularly regarding any perceived rivalry between the Fallout series uh, by Bethesda and those from Interplay, Black Isle, and Obsidian. And then at the premiere, Kane also caught up with Brian Fargo, founder of the original Fallout publisher Interplay, and currently the head of RPG Studio and Exile. They're working on Clockwork Revolution, another RPG I'm getting excited about. In the past, Kane criticized Fargo when explaining why he left development on Fallout 2 to found his own studio, and then he actually mentioned that because of him voicing this uh, disagreement that they had online, it led to Fargo experiencing abuse online, which uh, just shows really how crazy the Fallout community can be. But specifically, I did want to show this part of what Timmy Kane had said in his video. Um... We went to the after party. You've probably seen the picture when Brian and I came out. We uh, saw Todd and Emil. Um, I think we had gone in and then come right back out. But they took a picture out in front of the, the theater. Um, it was fun to talk to those guys. They're really nice. And, and and also, some of you guys, some of your stuff you say online, it's so off. So I kind of wish... Part of me wishes you guys could go to things like this and meet the people and not just play a game and then go off on the people. But anyway, 
They're super- yeah, this is not the first time that we've heard Tim Kaine defend Bethesda, and it's also not the first time that we've heard Obsidian developers speak up for Bethesda. And I do think specifically the people that are making these games, I don't think they dislike the people that are making the games at Bethesda. I certainly do think that they disagree with some of the decisions that they've made with the franchise. We've heard as much, and we've also seen that after Fallout New Vegas, especially coming from uh, Chris Avalone, he indicated that Bethesda wasn't too crazy about New Vegas and the reception that it got, good and bad. So I definitely do think that there is maybe a little bit of friction there at times on the creative front, but I do think the people making the games, I think that they are, of course, friendly, and we've seen as much in the photos and their interactions together. Now, it is worth mentioning that uh, Josh Sawyer, he also spoke up about the controversy surrounding the TV show, saying, canon this, canon that. Can the Brotherhood put some straps on the big-ass bags the Squires have to carry? And that's just a funny little joke about the situation. Again, we've heard all of this before. Fallout creator, again, this is Tim Kaine, uh, praising Bethesda for revitalizing the series. And hey, look, he's got the same helmet that I do, or something similar to it. Got my own right here. And I mean, we're all Fallout fans, and I think that's the big thing that we all need to remember. We're all Fallout fans, and uh, it's just unfortunate at times where this fan base is fractured, but I do think that the quality difference really is something that uh, factors into all of this and really bothers a lot of people. But as I said in the past, we've, he- we've heard from Obsidian Entertainment about uh, people you know, dissing Bethesda and them not liking it. Specifically, the CEO of Obsidian spoke about this back in 2019. Fergus Yurkart said he was surprised that some people assumed the team at Obsidian would uh, know back in 2015 when they started work on The Outer Worlds that the game's announcement would line up with a negative reception towards Bethesda's Fallout 76 at the end of 2018. People even said things about our trailer, oh man, just slamming it home to Bethesda because we said we're the original creators of Fallout and the makers of New Vegas. We have storyboards from July he says, I have no ill will for Bethesda. I love playing Fallout games. We're not fighting for the same dollars. Now, with all of that said, Obsidian defending Bethesda, we did get the official response coming from Bethesda about the whole TV show controversy alongside Amazon. This was featured in an IGN interview. And uh, this is what Todd Howard and Jonathan Nolan had to say about everything in regards to the show. Todd, of course, you're coming to this as kind of the lore master. When you went into the writer's room, did you have to correct a lot or did they already know their stuff? They really knew their stuff, I'll tell you what. Everybody behind the show, it's one of the things that you wish people could see. Well, I think you've seen the show in terms of the passion everybody involved in it brought to it from Jonah to Graham and Geneva, our showrunners, the actors, the whole cast and crew. I would ask people, are the TV show sets like this? Well, no. You see them all come together. And then another question. Jonah, this show makes some very large swings with Fallout lore, and you are no stranger to big IP. Uh, Is this too big a swing? Am I taking too much liberty with the lore here? He says, I think the part that was the most exciting but also nervous making were all of the flashbacks. And it was something that, as we're talking about it, Geneva and Graham, we're getting more and more excited about telling that story about what happened before the war, what precipitated the war. Cooper Howard's story, one little sliver of that larger story and a little bit more of an insight in vault That was the place where we were both the most reliant on talking with Todd and the team over there a lot about, okay, let us make sure that we don't, all this all of this fits together, plays nicely with the rest of the lore. But the ability for the show, which is something you might say, why even make a show out of a game? The game has so much flexibility, they're so big, they're so epic, there's so many choices that you can make, and you're removing a lot of the openness with the series, and that is ultimately always going to be an issue with the show. But the series can do things like flashbacks that are a little bit more challenging with the game. So that world, that world before the war, which is so distinct, so satirical, it is so much of the flavor of these games, and the ability to play in that, I think, was incredibly exciting to us. And then this is another big question. Was there any pushback on making a show that was extremely loyal to the lore and art design of the games? Howard said, I mean, there was lots of conversations. Things come up. Look, every time we do a game, we want to push the story forward as well. We're looking at things and how do we add. And so the show does that as well. As they had story elements that they wanted to do, it's like, oh, that's really interesting. Let's find a way to make that work. So this is actually kind of surprising because I assume some of the parts that we're about to go over was stuff that Bethesda thought up, but no, it was Amazon. So Graham and Geneva wanted to blow up Shady Sands. The first time they bring that up, you're like, what do you want to do? 
I had actually an emotional reaction to it, given the history of that location on the franchise from Fallout 1, and we talked through it. And it was, this will be a pretty impactful story moment that a lot of things anchor on. And just so people hear it, we're careful about the timeline. There might be a little bit of confusion <laughs> at some places, like Shady Sands being in LA now, but everything that happened in the previous games, including New Vegas happened, we're very careful about that. So it does look like Todd's hinting that the destruction that we see at the end of New Vegas may not be as it seems, and it's a wait and see type of situation. And so when they brought that up, threading that needle to make sure that that was a moment that landed on the show, that also moved things forward in terms of what's going to be happening in the world of Fallout. That was a big one that we talked about. And yeah, Shady Sands appeared at least to be a built up part of the Fallout universe, which we haven't really seen a full on rebuilt city, and they kind of just got rid of that and the perpetual destruction continues in the franchise and I do wonder if eventually we will see one day an actual functioning city that has been completely rebuilt after 200 years so far no now uh, this is another big question I was actually specifically going to ask you about Shady Sands the timeline conversation and you say that nothing in New Vegas is retconned I think the rub to kind of TLDR is that the fall of Shady Sands happens in 2277, which of which is four years before New Vegas. So are people just misunderstanding what the fall of Shady Sands means or something like that? And they are. All I can say is we're threading it tighter here, but the bombs fall just after the events of New Vegas. That's when Shady Sands blows. So sometime after 2281, which is when New Vegas was set, Shady Sands blows up, or well, is blown up by a nuke. So basically the fall of Shady Sands it doesn't mean a nuke necessarily, and he says correct, so it isn't necessarily a nuke. Okay, I'm glad we got that out of the way, that was a big question. Howard says, look, we are tight on dates if you really want to get into it, but what's important is when the show takes place, which is 2296, which is 15 years after New Vegas, 9 years after Fallout 4, what is happening in the time period of the show, and that's what's most important to us. And then this was another very big question I know people are going to be interested in. Now I'm going to ask you guys a number of questions, but I'm going to try it anyway. Staying on the subject of Coop, you have this huge reveal in the finale that Barb kind of betrayed him. It's a pretty evil decision. She was one of the architects of the nuking. Although there is a, shady, a shadowy figure in the background, I think that's the Enclave. Are we going to get answers for that? And he says, I don't know if you'd say there's a justification, but we are very much hoping to continue telling that story so we'll probably get more of a definitive answer about you know who dropped the bombs first and then this is another big big one about the NCR I'm curious how you guys see the NCR as it stands now is it demolished or is it kind of more like the Minutemen and Todd Howard teases that one of the takes that we always have is to approach things very locally when we're doing Fallout. We're careful about saying what's going on in other parts of the world, and we always take the view of communication as difficult. And this is where he gives some specific remarks about the NCR. And look, if you look at the background, the NCR is a wide-ranging sort of organization and group across not just California, but other places. So the show focuses on this period of time and this group here, and that's what we can say right now, but I don't think you've heard the last of the NCR. I think that's both in the TV show and probably with whatever they have planned for Fallout 5. So that was a very interesting interview coming from Todd Howard and Jonathan Nolan about the Fallout TV show. They clarified a lot. But even with this clarification coming from Todd, we also still have people mocking and making fun of it, uh, like this tweet here about 70,000 likes on it. Todd, the years don't add up. Yes, they do. But Todd, which part of New Vegas is canon? All of it. There's like five different endings, all of it. Another tweet saying, they buck broke Mr. Uh, House. How Mr. House sounds in this show and some of the things he says doesn't exactly line up with New Vegas. He could just be lying, but uh, yeah, some people are, are just, uh, yeah. It went from China launching the first strike to now these greedy capitalist organizations run by greedy rich billionaires deliberately nuked the world so they could run these obscure experiments on people's vaults. This is your lore when it's written by Indians and yeah, just making again fun of Bethesda. And then another tweet saying, it's really not the canon that matters, LOL, it's the fact that either way the TV show is setting back all the thematic progressions of the West Coast Fallout trilogy to keep the franchise locked in a perpetual state of looter shooterism. And that is definitely a criticism that Bethesda has to face with the decision to blow up Shady Sands. But anyway, we did get some clarity from Todd Howard. It does seem like a lot of people are more happy hearing that, yeah, they are 
very dedicated to the timeline. They're taking care of it, and there's going to be future plans, probably with the NCR. And of course, they're laying down little tidbits here and there for whatever they have planned for Fallout 5. But what do you make of Todd Howard's remarks? What do you make of the Obsidian developers defending Bethesda? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. But thank you for watching. Make sure to leave a like if you did enjoy this video or if you found any informative value. And consider subscribing for more videos like this. And I'll see you later.